You're listening to Science and Saucery, a show dedicated to adding life to your years. And now your hosts, registered dietitian Juliana Hever and scientist Ray Cronice. Welcome. Hello. Good morning. How are you doing today? Good, thank you. How are you doing, Raymond James? Doing great. Getting steps closer to be able to do some stream here, video streaming. Yes. Been working on the studio for weeks now, all the little details, and we're getting closer to be getting that part done. The only bad part about that is that I can't wear my pajamas when we record. <laughs> well, you can. <laughs> You'll just choose not to. Probably. So we'll just have to, you know, at some point, we'll just have to get a vote out there and get say, you know, when is Juliana going to do science and sorcery in her pajamas? <laughs> And <laughs> retweet if you think yes. And we'll <laughs> we'll just publicly uh, publicly shame you into doing uh, science and saucery in PJs. It could happen. It probably would be it's a hit. Darn comfortable, I have to say. Yeah, it's truth really be great. told. Yeah. So it's been fun doing lots of interviews lately. Mm-hmm. But we've also had a few fun episodes with just us talking, and that's what we're going to do today. Yes, we are. A subject that, that is near and dear to your heart, nutrition. Yes. And the idea and how your ideas of nutrition have changed even in the last couple of years. Uh, I know they've been evolving the whole time, but particularly in the last couple of years, you're taking a decidedly different approach to nutrition. I am. And, you know, I'm working on content for our health span transformation course. And I'm writing about the stuff about how often should we eat and how much should we eat and, and this topic that we talk about pretty frequently because it is one dominating dogma out there. And we've all, all of us dietitians and doctors and healthcare practitioners have become an echo chamber for this idea that nutrition is really an emergency, that we need to constantly chase nutrients. That there are acute deficiencies. Yes, but then as I was trained to look for things like scurvy and rickets and beriberi, I've never seen any of that. And as we always talk about in 2011, for the first time in history, there are more people chronically overnourished than undernourished which is mind blowing. Especially what what's what's interesting is that even you know when you're eating to the right of the triangle or like I say you know if you're eating a plant-based diet this is when nutrition becomes like an alarm a sounding alarm from others where people are so concerned about specific nutrients you know and they're going around asking people anyone that's saying no to a burger, like, well, where do you get your blah, blah, blah. It always sparks a conversation. And in reality, it's not a problem. The problem is the opposite direction. So I was, I was going around. I always say this too. I was, oh, I was going around speaking and writing. And my mission was to show the adequacy, the nutrient adequacy of eating plants. Defensive position. Very defensive. Because that's what everyone was worried about. People eating that way, people watching people eating that way, people that loved people eating that way. That was the concern is, well, where are, you know, you're going to, I don't know, fall down of a protein deficiency next week. You know, it's just, it, it really, people are really concerned about that. So I had this very defensive approach. Not really, I was just answering these questions. So was everyone else doing what I was doing at the time? And now what's so shifting, like game changing, like brain explosion is that, wait a second. And when, you know, you introduced a lot of this stuff to me, I'd heard some of it, but I didn't dive in as much as when we first came together, was that perhaps less is more. Right. What? You know, it's it's really crazy. You know, when we were walking around, when I was walking around that time, when you were at Fency and uh, you were at a booth there and I was wa- just walking around, Fency is the annual dietetics conference for the Academy of Nutrition Dietetics. So all the dietitians come together once a year. Right. And so it's, it's really sort of eye opening, um, going from booth to booth, to booth, to booth, listening 
to the question that dietitians are asking people. Um, the, the kinds of questions, really questions become a way for us to gauge where somebody's head is. In fact, you can learn more about a person by the questions they ask than the questions they answer. And so as a person coming from the outside and having read a few nutrition and metabolism books, but certainly I'm not a registered dietitian, I didn't go to dietetic school, I didn't you know, go through that whole process, I'm not the person that would be doing the you know, last minute medical intervention or what the standard protocol is. And that's, so that's a whole separate thing that we can get into. But I've learned a lot about the history of nutrition in the last, you know, eight years, let's just say. So what was really interesting is that the mindset and the framework by which nutrition is still taught today and by which all of these questions seem to emanate is this idea of when food was economically scarce. And so let's let's sort of, you know, maybe do the analogy to the bank account and let's do an analogy to money and bills. So a hundred dollars value is the same whether you're wealthy or broke. The value of a hundred dollars is still a hundred dollars. A lot of people that have never achieved money status sometimes forget that because they'll say, well, he's a billionaire or she's a billionaire. And so what's a hundred dollars to them? And the answer is it's exactly the same as to you. It doesn't matter how many of those you have, but in terms of what happens day to day, that hundred dollars is, and now I'm going to flip it back to nutrition is nutritionally is, is an equivalent. And what I mean by it is this, if you're trying to pay your bills monthly, and you're coming up $100 short, or you're coming up $1,000 short, or $500 short, or $10 short, if you're barely making enough to pay your bill, then how you spend each dollar becomes critically important. And likewise with nutrition, when food is economically scarce, which means a lot of times you have to depend on this food or that food, when food is economically scarce, then the nutrition that you're getting from that food becomes more acutely important. But as we move from economic scarcity of food, and there are places in the world that are still economically scarce, but they are small in comparison to the places in the world where nutrition is economically abundant. When we move into a world where just getting enough isn't a problem. And we can see that. How can we see it? Because everybody's overweight. You know, if everybody's overweight, it can't be because they have a a food deficiency. This should be intuitively obvious to all those people. But I think they don't listen again, listening to those questions that are coming from dietitians and not trying to fat shame, not trying to call out. But, you know, you see all these people who they themselves are, are, are not healthy they're not even close to a normal weight. I'm not talking about that they're not fitness models because that's obviously not necessary. But they're not even close to being healthy. And they walk around and they're asking these nutrition questions, which are the same nutrition questions that were planted in their mind 25 years earlier when they were in undergraduate or graduate school in nutrition. And when food is economically abundant and you have lots of it, then nutrition becomes less and less and less acute issue. And that's where we are today. And one of the problems that I see by this idea, which is a good idea, again, the DRIs, all of these guidelines for what we should take in each day is based on meeting that minimum budget, meaning, so malnourishment does not just mean not enough. Malnourishment also means too much. We don't talk about it much because for most people and for throughout human history, overnourishment was only a problem of wealthy. It was the diet of affluence. But now affluence has become even the poor. In fact, the idea that obesity is a symptom of poverty shows us that you know, we have this excess of food. 
And digging one more step deeper in that, people will then argue or they'll move to, yes, but they're empty calories. And I, and I will agree that the nutritional content of some of the empty foods that have caused obesity aren't abundant with nutrition. But then if they really were nutrient deficient, and now I'll give it back to you on this, wouldn't you be seeing scurvy and rickets and these kinds of things? And the answer is you're not seeing those things. Well, it's so interesting. <clears throat> I mean, we work mostly, we do a lot of weight loss. You know, that, that's what our company is. That's what we, our clients come to us to lose significant amounts of weight. And while nutrition has some, you know, intricacies when it comes to perhaps kidney disease or um, different diagnoses that happen, you know, maybe you, you alter things when it comes to I don't know, specific cancer or specific, there's specific instances where nutrients are quite relevant. You have to be more careful and it's more chemical equation type stuff going on. Like obviously someone doing tube feeding or TPN. But when we're talking about weight loss and we're talking about all of that, I, I, it, I think it's really interesting when I see, you know, I'm in some of these groups on Facebook or whatever, just I check in once in a while with all these other dietitians, because I don't go to a lot of those events. I only went to that event that one time because I was working there at a booth. But I, you know, I try, I don't really spend a lot of time around a lot of dietitians unless I'm at a conference speaking or something like that. So I go and I check in on these booths and I, I mean, in these uh, groups, and I find it so interesting because it's become this really strange dialogue of, well, this person, I'll see all these people say, okay, well, a client came in today and they have, you know, they're eating blah, 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 and they're exercising three times a week and they can't lose weight. So then everyone's like, well, have they checked their thyroid and it must be their hormones and how old are they? And, you know, it must be, it's like, there's all of these rationalizations that go way beyond the simplicity of what we teach. It's like, well, it's just the food, you know, you're eating too much food. You can't really hold on to extra weight if you're not bringing it in, you know, and it's, it's really, it's, it's that simple. And yet it's become so hyper complicated. And I don't understand how we've gone off in such a crazy direction because yeah. we are nobody, we don't have those. Yes. Iron deficiency and iodine deficiency are happening around the world, but it's usually, and almost exclusively when there's not enough calorie when it is an economically scarce environment. If we go back specifically with iodine, for example, because this is this is an interesting study in history and nutrition, and it proves this point about the economic side. So, you know, going back to the original study of the 2100 schoolgirls in 1917 that ended up demonstrating conclusively that the goiters and thyromegalia was a result of an iodine deficiency and that iodine supplementation uh, could avoid that. And there were certain places, in, and this was in the Great Lakes region, the Appalachian Mountains, the Northwest, those are places where actually iron is less abundant in the soils, less abundant in general, and those are the places where in the water, these were places where people were getting um, more of that uh, or less of that. And so what's really interesting about that particular um, position is that Originally, they proposed, because also having grown up with a cattle farm, salt licks, and having minerals, trace minerals as part of raising cattle and animal husbandry is a really important type. There, there are blue salt licks that have cobalt in them. There are brown salt licks. There are black salt licks that have, have everything. There are white ones that are just sodium chloride. You know, there are yellow ones that have sulfur. And based on certain issues, you'll put out these salt licks and you'll even find natural salt licks, places in the ground that are high mineral content that animals like deer will, will lick this. Hunters will know this as well. But here's the point. What was originally, what originally happened with this whole iodine deficiency is that what we were doing with this combination of animal husbandry at the time and livestock and USDA and food, which was USDA. So remember, USDA was both an organization that promoted food for humans and still does and nutrition, but at the same time, they also were there as the U.S. Department of Agriculture and they were, you know, popularizing animal husbandry. Well, what's really interesting is after those 1920s 
and this endemic iodine deficiency that was prevalent that they were trying to address, they really came up with iodizing salt as a response to a salt lick, and iodine was going to be supplemented in a normal way. And then someone comes up with the idea that we can iodize salt, which is true, we can, Mm -hmm. and salt was something that was, you know, part of culture because when food is pretty bland, you know, salt, you know, the salt, you know, the the crazy King Ludwig in, in Bavaria, you know, grew all, you know, had all of this wealth off of the salt mines that they found, you know, there because when salt, when food was just less available, salt makes boring food taste a lot better. There's no doubt that it does. But, but really and truthfully, you know, the, the first iodine salt gets, hits the grocery stores around 1924 and a bunch of states were basically pushing this whole idea of fortifying salt, fortifying salt, fortifying salt. And then the salt becomes, the means becomes the end, you know, this classic thing about the means becoming the end. Then it all became about iodized salt. And now fast forward a century later, and we're now producing all these fancy salts, pink salts, brown salts, whatever salts, but not in this case for their min- mineral, that, although the colors well, obviously they, are related and to the minerals. they say it's for the minerals, ex- right. extra but, minerals. But what ends up happening is, is now they're not getting the iodine and we're seeing some resurgence of goiters and they're blaming it on cruciferous vegetables, right? It's the right, crazy kind soy, of thing. and soy. And soy, right. But the thing is, by the way, too much iodine also can cause problems with your thyroid. So right. that's kind of an interest. That's an intri- interesting nutrient because there's like a very fine threshold. And we're talking about micrograms here. So that that is an interesting right. nutrient. Right. So 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 when this comes down to it, when we look at this and this really becomes this really becomes the beginning of vitamins. And even vitamins, you know, most people have no idea it was vitamins with an e on the mm-hmm. end. Where did that come from? Because at that time there was somebody who there, there was a scientist that hypothesized that part of what was happening in certain deficiencies that because amino acids and proteins were very important at that point in, in in research and they hypothesized that what was then a turns out to be a b deficiency because it had to do with uh with um rice and polishing rice and the issues with berry berry mm-hmm. right so what in what he what he what he discussed was the idea that it was vital amines because these amino acids had these amine groups, and he just guessed that it was amines that they were deficient. It was an amine, general amine compounds, amine, meaning it's a nitrogen compound in organic chemistry, and vitamins, vital amines, had to do with the B deficiency, right? I amine. But, <laughs> but in terms of vitamin, vitamin stuck became this generic term for taking these you know, micronutrients. micronutrients. And then we became a society, because again, we, we really back in, the, back in the turn of the 20th century, counting things made was really important. Accounting was really important. How many barrels of this? How many pounds of that? How many bushels of these? You know, everything was about accounting. And what ended up happening is we've spawned this entire industry now of people really believing that they're overweight because they have some micronutrient they're deficient in. And then this is triggering some kind of hunger, which is triggering some mm-hmm. kind of, well, I don't know. I don't know how the calories magically get into their mouth, but I used to think this way. I can tell you that. I used to believe that somehow nutrition that nutrition adequacy, that somehow I was craving and making up for nutrition deficiencies and that I was overeating because I was deficient in this or that. And that somehow taking a handful of micronutrients, you know, here's the first key in the word micro, taking those that somehow I was going to Ameliorate the situation. I mean, it's like it's like if you're a heroin addict, and of course you're craving heroin. Or if you're, you know, I mean, these this whole concept of your body must be lacking in that nutrient and that's why you're craving french fries or steak right. i mean it's always like some kind of decadent western food it's it's crazy it's like why what it's like mixing it's like everyone's looking for an answer well we want to be diagnosed you know, this is the, this is our thesis of you're not broken 
If you start from a thesis, for example, if we go back to, you know, and we've said this on so many podcasts, Jeffrey Rhodes, for sick to individual sick populations, I always get it backwards. We go back to why did this patient get this disease at this time? Too few physicians are asking that question. What they're asking is, how do I manage disease? When you were talking with Robbie and um, Cyrus, you were saying very specifically, you know, they're talking about mastering and reversing their diabetes rather than just managing diabetes. Well, they don't reverse it because well, they have not type, type one, one but, but I'm just two, saying yeah. in general that that approach with type two, where you can reverse and instead of just manage. Right. And even that, I mean, going back, I'm this is a little sidetrack, but even that, a lot of people are simply believing they're managing diabetes by going on a low carb diet, right? By removing the antagonist. But so, so bringing this full circle back to nutrition and economy and you're not broken, this idea that you need a certain amount of this micronutrient or that micronutrient every day is kind of silly on its face. It probably matters a lot back to that. What's the value of a dollar? What's the value of a hundred dollars? If you're barely getting enough food to eat, then each meal becomes nutritionally more significant. However, in a world of abundance, the idea that biologically we were scavenging in nature and we just so happened to get all of the nutrition every single day that we needed so this is, is, is kind of a crazy thought, right? Yeah, it is now in context, even though we don't think about it like that and we I don't think most people really think about that. Like you just, this is what we know to be true. Um, but it's interesting because this is leading to problems on the other side. You know, just because something is good doesn't mean more is better. And this is the case with nutrition. And certainly it's happening with just, just if you look at energy and calorie and the obesity epidemic, but even more specifically, you know, they've, they've, they found this vitamin du jour. Like first it was, you know, vitamin... I think vitamin A came first or vitamin E. One of them came first and it was like, the, the you know, it's going to help reduce cholesterol and it's going to help you with heart, reduce cardiovascular disease. So they concentrated, isolated it and gave it out as supplements. And it backfired. And same thing with vitamin A and smokers with the beta carotene. And they actually, they had to stop their study short, the carrot studies, because they were, the people that were taking the supplement were dying more or faster than those that weren't than the controls. So interestingly, and now we're on vitamin D, that's become a new thing too. So this hyper vitamin vitaminization, I guess you could say, of us, of humans and hyper nutri nutritionism, I guess you could say, you know, where people are taking these powders, you know, that have all the nutrients and a vitamin and a bar that's fortified and this and more this, more that, more this. And, you know, I need a smoothie because I need to concentrate the nutrition and the soil is depleted. And all of these attempts to get more and look at where it's leading us. And I'm sure there's going to be, you know, this stuff is unfolding, but people aren't looking at it like that. They're still thinking there's something missing or there's something else. Yeah. And, and one thing that sort of, I think, rides on top of this concept, this top of nutrition being an emergency, especially if we now bring in the food triangle because one of the goals originally that we were working on with the food tri triangle was to also sort of address the micronutrition element and what's what's interesting and and this is very very general but if i were going to put the the animal and plant source food into different nutritional buckets what i would generally say is you know, on the plant-based side, there are things that we need to think about in terms of iodine to a, to a different degree. Iron. That's a, the, these. I'm going to bring up even the controversial ones: zinc, selenium, calcium, vitamins A, D, B12, uh, protein, specifically. You know, things like uh, uh, taurine or any of the essential amino acids, omega-3 fatty acids. On the animal side, vitamin A, D, C, E, folate, calcium, potassium, magne magnesium, iron. And iron again is a different. It's another way there because we're getting excesses of it of overnutrition, and fiber, dietary fiber, which we don't find over there. And what's really interesting when we look at both sides is it's true that as we go up the food chain, you know, animals concentrate nutrition; they don't uh, cre create it for the most part. For the most part, 
it plants since they don't eat since most plants almost all plants don't eat <laughs> we'll put our pitcher plants and venus fly traps and things in there as the the, carn the the few carnivorous ones that are there but they still photosynthesize primarily anyway the the point here is is that these organisms that can't eat must synthesize all of their nutrition and that's why we find a a plethora of micronutrients and phytonutrients phyto from light you know phytonutrients um in terms of i mean from plants plants i don't phyto know like, wait a second are you talking about for, the mechanism right. yeah. or okay so so but the idea that a lot of nutrition is created and then it's concentrated up and then this leads to you know something that i got started on originally with joel Furman of the idea of nutri nutrient density meaning you know health equals um, nutrients, per, nutrients per calorie. Yeah, yeah, nutrients per calorie. And while that's true, what ended up happening is that same concept got co-opted by the Paleolithic and some of these other people saying, oh, oh yeah. well, you know, if we want to really look at nutrition, we're going to look at things like liver, you know, organ meat is all nutritionally dense, you know, because there are places where we store, for example, B vitamins right. we store in liver. And this is true. It is true yep. that in some past whatever whatever you know part i don't know that it necessarily had to be the paleolithic but any in some nutritional past obviously there are sources of some of these you know plant sourced nutrition that ends up in animals because they store it just like we store it how do they reconcile but, the, but i want to make one more point before we go off on this the the point i'm making is that without limiting calorie this health equals n over c ends up becoming Meaningless because just getting the maximum amount of nutrition, these foods are the nutrient sense. So I see now the animal, animal food side doing the exact same mistake that the green smoothie vegans were doing forever, which is everything becomes a goal to suck down as much nutrition as we can. And that would be important if and only if we had some kind of data, even like a couple of studies, that suggested overnutrition was a way to lengthen life. And what we've seen repeated and conserved in biology is that overnutrition is great for fecundity and reproduction, but it also then decreases longevity. And the only way we've, in a strictly dietary sense, extended organisms' life is through dietary restriction. And I said dietary restriction without malnutrition because I don't want to say calorie restriction because it's not only about the calories. It's also about other nutrition that gets restricted. So this idea that abundance of, you know, liquefying everything in a blender and sucking it down or eating each little fraction of pig toe because you think that something's in there and we got to grind this thing up to get the maximum thing or bone broth for goodness sakes. It's crazy to think that both sides are looking at the same coin. You know, one side sees a, a buffalo, the you know, same nickel. One see, sees a buffalo, the other one sees an Indian. Broccoli. <laughs> you know, and the bottom, and, and this idea that we're trying to get the most nutrition harkens back to back to where we started this, which is when food was economically scarce, all the nutrition counted. Now go to your that side point that you were going to make. No, just a side point about this whole thing about, oh, you can't, you know, we have to have animals because that's where the nutrition is concentrated. But plants are poisonous and you can't eat them and they have lectins and, you know, phytates and oxalates and you shouldn't eat them. I'm like, well, wait a second. Where do you think the animal got these nutrition, these nutrients, you know, concentrated? It was from the plants. So I just, I wonder how they reconcile that. I've always wondered that. It, well, it, the point here is, is that we have an immune system. And that immune system sometimes reacts to a protein in a nut and it sometimes reacts to a protein in a shrimp in people who have immune systems that are you know hyperactive let's just say overexpressed these are genetic abnormalities in the whole thing a whole view of uh, of nutrition but we have a system that naturally detoxifies these kinds of elements that come in to our diet. Well, not only that, I mean, but there is some perhaps benefits of some of those, you know, That's phytates right. happen to be a phytonutrient really. And, you know, 
I'm just wondering how they kind of well, how hormesis, they say something. Yeah, hormesis, all of hormesis, of you know, is basically built on the idea. There, some one of the original uh, papers in hormesis had to do with farmers that were exposed being exposed to pesticides, and they saw an increase in in immune response based on the fact that small microtoxins. You know, this is the famous scene from Princess Bride. You know, where he's he's trying to play the guess on which one has the. Uh, which one has the uh, the poison in it, right? I so, love that scene. Yeah, it's really <laughs> I love great. That movie. But I think that this idea that you know, bringing it back to that conference and bringing it back to your change from a plant based diet being one of justifying or defending its adequacy, rather than say it's what it's limited in in nutrition or restricted in in nutrition but not deficient in, is actually a benefit. Yeah, and I want to emphasize, you know, we're saying this, and I, I also do have, we still appreciate the importance of nutrition. We're not saying it doesn't matter, because it does matter. And one of the benefits of a plant-based diet is, yes, probably the things that it naturally restricts, you know, like heme iron and saturated fat and all of those things. But it's also, you know, a great way to get, there's all these other reasons that a plant-based diet is so efficacious, as far as we know. All of those phytonutrients, all of the, that fiber that we know is crucial. There's so much evidence. So that said, you know, you know, we have some of our clients take a multivitamin just to cover the bases and all that. But I think the message is really empowering and relaxing. It's more of a, you know what, it's okay. You don't have to chase protein you don't have to make sure you're getting all of these different foods every single day and meeting 100% of the DRI every single day. To me, as a dietitian, it's almost like it's almost like heresy, you know, because it's it's okay to not be so worried about it and it's okay to just not have to keep pushing food. And granted, you know, even even the athletes that come to us, they do fine. They do great. They do even sometimes often better, better than they were doing before when they Unless. stop when they stop slugging all that stuff and and making sure they're carb loading and quote unquote all that stuff and all that replenishment. So it, to me, it's a it's a very um, empowering message and it's a very soothing message compared to what we hear everywhere else. Right, and just bringing back because I'm. I'm such a Princess Bride fan, but bringing us back to that Iocane powder, you know, the whole scene is about the battle of the wits, right? Who's going to be smarter? Who's going to be more strategic in terms of, and if you haven't seen it, just go, you know, look, first you should watch Princess Bride if you haven't seen it, but you can just look at battle of the wits and Iocane powder, and I'm sure Google will pull up a clip out there. But the bottom line here is that listening to that conversation sounds a lot like listening to a vegan and carnivore argue over nutrition because they're both going back and forth. And my guess is, is that both of them are probably subjecting themselves to, <laughs> to some form of overnutrition from their approach if they're all moving into the, the realm of the hedonistic kind of decadent eating that we find in restaurants and these rare and appropriate moments. I'm not saying don't ever do this, but if your life is defined by whatever burgers or grass-fed burgers, either one, you're probably not going to do that well. You may do well short-term in terms of fecundity. And, and yeah. this, is the, this is the trap. The trap with this nutrition and overnutrition is that a lot of these people that are on YouTube, that are on Twitter that are on Instagram are somewhere between 20 and 50. And during that reproductive prime, so let's say that peaks out somewhere around 45 or 50, they actually might feel really, really good. You know, what comes to mind is the young 30-something doctor who still has youth on his side or her side, and they're, you know, eating the carnivore diet or they're eating a hardcore vegan diet, and they're doing really well in the moment. The question is, how are they going to do at 50, at 60, at 70, or 80? And when you're younger, I think a lot of people make the mistake of saying, well, I don't care what happens later because right now I want to be youthful and, and young. And it turns out that each decade that passes, it doesn't seem as old as it used oh, to yeah. seem to you when you, were, when you were younger. And 
with that said, as the last decade has passed, I've watched a lot of my friends that are about the same age age a lot faster. Me than, too. Than and I've I'm a de- I'm a decade behind you and I'm seeing so many crazy things happen to my 40-year-old's friends and I didn't ever expect that to happen at this age. And people that I wouldn't call out as living an unhealthy life. You know, they relatively work hard to eat quote unquote well. <laughs> you know, they sometimes listen to me, sometimes don't or you know, they they exercise and all of that and it's it's a real reality slap to kind of watch your friends, your peers go through these health problems. And it's it's kind of terrifying, you know, like you thought that happened to your parents and grandparents' friends, um, but that was way far away. And here we are dealing with it. Yeah, it's one thing to go to your reunion, your 10 or 15 year reunion and see the, the uh, stereotypical cheerleader or football jock, you know, who was, you know, all the business, you know, the, the you know, the best looking or whatever. But it's another thing to see like a consistency, you know, and I remember I first started noticing it when I would be around at the time when my children were still in high school and I would go to these events and the people that were my children's friends, parents, when I would be around them, I would often look and say, wow, you know, I don't feel that old. And then of course we would start getting the comments from my children's friends where they would say, my gosh, your dad just doesn't look like my dad <laughs> or you're, you know, you know, so I think there is a slowing. I think there's slowing. I don't think you're, you know, we've said this before, you're not going to live forever eating carrots, but at the same time, there obviously, it, there seems to be something that's consistent with these other issues in nutrition when nutrition is not over nutrition but adequate nutrition, meaning adequacy becomes a goal, it seems like there is an impact there. Again, that's that's my N of one, but it just seems to be backed up by a lot of ends of many and other <laughs> organisms. Yeah, it's really fascinating. And, you know, what do you take with what do you take away from this this information? You know, that the it's not we're not giving you a complete an ex, an actual guideline. We're saying, you know, just maybe it's time to rethink what we make our decisions based on when it comes to food. And, you know, we have our clients kind of go into that silo and just in our little, we call it our cult, don't talk about it because everyone, this is the prime directive of the layperson. It's a prime directive of media. You know, I get Google alerts for for nutrition topics every day. And it's like the headline after headline of, you can't get this new, you have to, you know, people are concerned about nutrient this, or where do you get your fill in this nutrient? And it's every day. And this is years of this. And we are just, I think we're just, we've passed that point and we need to start wondering about maybe it's too much and maybe we need to just calm down and focus on making it simple. And it sounds kind of crazy, but if you really look at the data you know, they're very compelling. And I feel like, you know, we've seen amazing results with our clients. I've seen amazing results, you know, with with changing my recommendations way beyond what I used to see when I was personal training and, and mm-hmm. kind of, you know, doing the whole protein message, all of that. It's changed dramatically and, and people feel good. And you, you see the difference in the people. Again, not a study. This is not a study. These are not specific recommendations. What what we want is for people to just maybe rethink it and yeah again what where I started this is the questions we ask and I think that we're we're now at a place where we need to ask a different kind of question and we need to ask a question based on human flourishing we need to be able to say okay look it's true that there are certain issues that we must think about when it comes to nutrition and poverty where food in general, is economically scarce. There are probably another set of conditions we need to think about when someone is impoverished, but food is economically abundant for them. Again, right now, obesity is a symptom of poverty, and that should say a lot. So we've managed to... to Flip it. Yeah, we've managed to flip it, but we've managed to conquer one in one issue in our environment, which is having enough to eat. But we've now created this other issue, and I don't believe physicians and dietitians and nurses are even 
beginning to ask that question within their training. The physicians, you know, I heard from 2009 forward in TedMed, all of those talks, the idea that physicians have nutritional uh, training, it is minimal to non-existent. You know what dietitians learn, and in terms of what they do, so much of it is just rote mem memorization and tables and doses, it's, et cetera. It's an echo chamber of, of numbers and tables and, and right. executing and how to avoid any deficiency. It is a completely a deficiency model. Everything is based on avoiding it. And not only avoiding deficiency, but we always err on the side of do a little bit more just in case. Always, always. I mean, it's it's even when it comes to weight loss, which by definition means reduction, right? Reduce less, but no one wants to kind of just understand that. Like it's, it's Right. When we look at most of the studies that we have for weight loss, these people are losing 10 or 12 pounds over 12 weeks. They're not even in the survival mode of our species. Our species evolved and most all species had to evolve coping mechanisms for scarcity. That's why we store certain things. That's why we have certain things. That's why we become overweight to begin with. What are the coping mechanisms for chronic overnutrition and how would any organism in 100 years evolve coping mechanisms for chronic overnutrition? I mean, how would we, how would that even occur in nature? And I don't think it does. Well, that's what that's what's so interesting. Does. What we we've spoken about before that fecundity and and um, is going down. You know, people are having more and more issues with reproducing. So perhaps that's you know, and and you know, like um, Dr. Naughton said when we talked to her. You know, all of the patients that come to her with erectile dysfunction are overweight or obese. Like most of them have that, or they're eating a bad diet. So like that is a very interesting thing to note. Right, and then. Many people don't go to the next step, especially with diabetes, even though weight issues are associated with those things, their penis will start working again if they change their diet well before their, their obesity is gone. And the same thing with diabetes. You can reverse the symptoms of diabetes. We see this in bariatric patients even. The issues mm -hmm. that with type 2 diabetes are reversed before the weight is gone. So weight may be a common symptom, just like glucosuria is a common symptom between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. It's not the cause, and it's not, it not, it's not necessarily. Those two things have no similarity in, in their pathology. They're, they're just not even related. What we really see when we say you're not broken in a succinct message is that most of our vices or problems we perceived are evolutionary advantages gone awry. And it's better explained by cultural and social norms outpacing genetics. That's really what it comes down to. And that's the thing that I think we need to say over and over and over again. A lot of these things that we're looking at are actually adaptive evolutionary benefits. Even this one, thinking about it, in times when you have very low nutrition input, meaning you have some restriction, maybe even some deficiencies in your diet of certain deficiencies, then the organism responds by not getting pregnant, fecundity goes down. And mechanisms like the sirtuin genes and others are activated that actually preserve the organism for a time later when food is abundant. So this idea that these things, you know, how would we, for example, how would we get the average study that we do on weight loss, how would you create a diet in nature that was calorie deficient but provided all of the nutrition? Because every one of those studies that they do because we don't want to, you know, take a risk with our IRBs. We don't want to take a risk that somebody is, you know, deficient in iron or something for a few days. So we construct a diet that is purposely nutritionally complete. It's an like alphabet soup. Yeah, it's the soyant green, right? Yep. They're given the gloop, but calorically 
Low. deficient. Right. You wouldn't construct that. So if no. a person really wants to use nature as a model, and nature isn't always the best model, but if you did, you would say, hey, look, what happens when I naturally restrict certain foods? And we've looked at this. For example, in gorillas, we know that their highest protein intake is during non-fruit season when they're primarily eating leaves. When they're actually eating the calorically the most deficient food that they have during the season, that's when their protein intake is the highest. When they're on the fruit side, it actually is diminished. So it's really kind of interesting that we can, we've seen this in nature. We've seen that nutrition you know, waxes and wanes in biology. And again, Mimicking biology and mimicking nature is not necessarily the way we're going to live the longest, but I just think it's important for people to think about when they're looking at these studies, especially all the people that are the end of many Twitter things. Well, yeah, there wasn't very many people. Oh, that study wasn't well controlled. Well, they didn't control for protein. Oh, they didn't control. All of that crap. And you say to yourself, most of these studies, by default, especially weight loss studies, don't in any way mimic any of our coping mechanisms because they make sure they get everything. Yeah, it's quite the conundrum. Yeah, it is. So, so it's you're not fun. O- you're not only a scientist, but you're also a scholar. <laughs> I don't and know a about historian. that. Historian. <laughs> no, it's these are really interesting things to weave together. That again, we don't talk about in the healthcare industry. I I, I think we've have to find a way to design studies in a different way, and this is what. David and Drew and I envisioned what you and I have now carried forward using the food triangle and not controlling for nutrition. Mm -hmm. Imagine that. Imagine, look, at the end of the day, we want to know what to eat. Why not just start with things, real food, that actually, and see how the nutrition goes, and then figure out, back figure out what maybe the mechanism is? Because it's way too complicated. I don't believe we're ever going to guess macros. I don't believe we're ever going to guess oh, no. percentages of, of no. micronutrients. Oh, no. I just don't think. I think we will we will do the genetic engineering and g- gene therapy way before we figure out that melu. Perhaps. We shall see. Yes. But for now. For now, we've been talking about fun nutrition. Mm-hmm. And... It's time for us to uh, <laughs> I got to catch go. a plane. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all so much for joining us on this leafy green path to good health. It's always the food. So remember, keep, keep eating, eating right. right. Thank you for listening to Science and Saucery. For more details about the content in today's show or to contact Juliana and Ray, please visit us at healthspansolution.com. Healthspan Solution.